response of the uh, of all of them and all of the individuals. It also was such an extraordinary week that the terrible tragedy in uh, Texas occurred, uh, where ten ten members of a small fire department uh, were killed. So. With thanks to all of those who we performed so well and in memory of those we have lost and who are going through uh, recovery, let's have a moment of silence. Thank you very much. And this is uh, not as regular a meeting of the Board of Police Commissioners with the history of the last week, but it is, of course, a regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners. And Madam Secretary, uh, uh, please call the roll. Good morning. Let the record reflect Commissioners Orden, Mack, Bernardino, Julian, and Saltzman are present, and we have a quorum, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, we begin with commission comments. Are there uh, comments from the commissioners? Madam President, thank you. Um, last week, uh, I was able to attend the department's uh, Valley Bureau's Asian Pacific Islander Forum, and uh, it was hosted and moderated by uh, Commander Papa, uh, and also uh, in attendance, uh, because uh, traffic is a concern in the Valley, uh, was uh, Dave Ferry, <coughs> Lieutenant Ferry from the Valley Traffic Division, and it was uh, an informative time. Uh, it was well, uh, very well attended. And um, I think it was very lively in that there was many questions and, and all the Valley captains were there. And so it was, um, uh, you know, the kind of community forum that we want to have with uh, input coming in from the community and, and providing answers where there were questions. So it was a very rewarding time. The food was great and it was a good way to spend an evening. Thank you. Any other comments this morning? With that, we'll uh, move to uh, comments from the ch Chief of Police. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, members of the uh, Commission. Uh, before I uh, make a presentation, the weekly presentation on crime, I'd just like um, a moment, if you would allow me to, to uh, talk about a few things that occurred this past uh, weekend, the first of which um, I, I'd like to tell you that I had an opportunity to attend, um, I believe, the first annual cadet job fair that was held here at PAB, um, sponsored by Operation Central Bureau and organized by Lieutenant uh, Elaine Morales, who happens to be in the audience here today. I was very pleased with the attendance. There were hundreds of young people uh, who came and had an opportunity to speak personally with employers, uh, were given opportunities to understand job search techniques. Um, uh, they had um, an opportunity to uh, deal with em employers themselves and, and were distributed materials about job searches. Just a really good opportunity for them to interact with employers themselves and introduce themselves to uh, the job market. So it was, a, it was an extremely successful event uh, that the department will continue to support uh, in years to come. And so um, kudos and compliments to OCB and also to Lieutenant Elaine Morales for the good work that she did in putting that together. <coughs> Uh, all of you know, too, that this was an incredibly busy weekend for the department uh, in the wake of the Boston bombing incident. Um, the, the department, in, in the wake of that, uh, had a responsibility, obviously, to keep this city safe, not knowing whether or not there was any uh, nexus or relationship of that event to something else that may have been going on or planned for uh, other parts of the country. Um, no, and just be reminded, I would, I would tell those in attendance that the department had uh, the responsibility of policing several large-scale events, some of which included um, a very successful Ciclavia event uh, at which I believe I'm told that nearly 100,000 people participated over the weekend or actually on Sunday. In addition to that, uh, our department partnered with USC Department of Public Safety uh, in policing and providing security on the campus of USC at the USC Times uh, Festival of Books. Uh, at which uh, over 150,000 people attended over the weekend, um, uh, not to mention uh, events at uh, Dodger, sporting events at Dodger Stadium. Uh, the Clippers began their first uh, campaign towards a, a championship series, uh, of course, not to <laughs> suggest that the Lakers will not. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, the Clippers had their uh, championship, uh, started their championship series, and also the Kings were uh, playing at the um, Staples Center as well. 
at which all of those events we had the um, responsibility of providing police service. Uh, should also include, too, the, the Israeli festival that was held on the west side uh, of the city. Uh, it's my understanding uh, nearly 20,000 people attended that event uh, in addition to all the others. And so it was an extremely busy weekend in terms of public safety. And I'm very pleased to, to, to say on behalf of the chief of police uh, that we had no incidents here in the city of Los Angeles. And I think it's a reflection of, of our department working a very intelligent way in terms of plans and the execution of those plans. And also in partnership with the, um, the community members throughout the city, uh, we urge them uh, if they see something say something and they've been extraordinarily uh, good in that partnership and and being um, uh, 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 good community members that helped uh, police the city um, and so again very busy weekend and it's in it, there's all appearances that we uh, had a successful one <clears throat> uh, as it relates to crime the, the department continues on um, such a good track um, <clears throat> Last week, homicides were down 17.2%, which is about, if my memory serves correct, um, about 15, 15, 16 homicides uh, fewer this year compared to last. Uh, in addition to that, sexual assaults are down nearly 30%. Robberies are down 12%. Uh, aggravated assaults, assault with a deadly weapon, they're down nearly 13% for a total violent crime reduction for last week at 13.4%. Uh, our nemesis property crime, we actually saw or continue to see reductions in, in that category as well. Uh, burglaries are down 5.6%. Uh, thefts, uh, motor vehicle thefts are down nearly 2% at 1.7. Uh, burglaries and thefts from vehicles are down 4%. Personal thefts are down 10.5% for a total property crime reduction last week of 6.1%, which brings a total for part one crime uh, down to 7.4%. In, in terms of what that really means in, in, in uh, fewer victims, that's 2,300 fewer victims this year compared to last. And once again, it's just um, a, a superb reflection on the dedication, the commitment, and frankly, the, the intelligent police work that the uh, area captains have committed to, also in partnership um, with operation, uh, special operations, um, the Office of Special Operations in terms of the partnership and helping uh, to reduce those crime uh, figures. Uh, by Bureau, Central Bureau year-to-date is uh, down 9.7%. South Bureau is cataloging a negative 4.1% reduction. Uh, the Valley Bureau is at 3% reduction, and West Bureau is 14.4% reduction in part one crime. Uh, as it relates to gang crime, homicides, gang homicides are down 23.5%. Robberies are down 21%. And what a beautiful introduction that was <laughs> for gang crime. Uh, total gang crime is down uh, 20%. Wait till you hear the next of it. <laughs> year, year to date. Uh, by Bureau, uh, Central Bureau for gang crime is down 33.4%. South Bureau is down 17.5%. Uh, Valley Bureau is tracking well at 3.3% reduction. And West Bureau is down nearly 21%. So um, it's... It's too early to declare success. We won't walk across um, the bridge of that battleship and, and, and declare victory. But by the same token, I'm very pleased on behalf of Chief Beck to report that our crime numbers are tracking in a, in a very, very good direction. That concludes the uh, presentation of the Chief of Police. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. A report of the executive director. Morning, Madam President, members of the commission. Uh, a few brief items. Uh, first, the department has requested that item 8, F as in Frank, on the regular agenda be removed from the agenda. And uh, secondly, uh, next uh, Tuesday, April 30th, uh, there will be no regular meeting of the Board of Police Commissioners at 9.30 a.m. Uh, that there will be a special community meeting uh, April 30th, uh, 2013, at 6.30 p.m at John W. Mack Elementary School, 3020 South Catalina Street in Los Angeles. And the community is invited. Um, the, uh, the area command uh, will be there to uh, interact with the community and present uh, status of the community crime issues. And the Board of Police Commissioners will be there to hear from the community on any issues or concerns that they may have. So with that, we look forward to seeing the community at that meeting on April 30th, 6.30 p.m., John W. Mack Elementary School, 3020 South Catalina Street. And that concludes my report. Thank you. 
uh, report of the Inspector General. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Commissioners, uh, I wanted to inform the Commission of a partnership that the Inspector General's Office has uh, been involved in as of late. Uh, we've been teaming up with the Human Relations Commission in getting out into the community and trying to uh, let the stakeholders in the community know about the IG's role and the Commission's role so the people are a little bit more aware of the process. And to that end, we've, par as I said, partnered up with the Human Relations Commission and have done focus groups to try to make sure we've got the right format to get out to the community and make sure that there was some interest uh, for these type of meetings. The meetings are generally just members of the Inspector General's office, and we will do about a 15, 20 minute review of what the office does, and then open it up to about two to three hours worth of question and answers from the community. Uh, the Human Relations Commission has been kind enough to set up uh, these meetings and identify the stakeholders that they believe need uh, to meet with the IG's office and understand the process so that they can get that information out to the community and we can kind of amplify uh, that meeting and, and the, the reach of that meeting. Uh, so far we've had a, a couple informal meetings just to make sure that we have the process set up, but we have a formal meeting now scheduled for this Thursday evening. It's going to be in South Bureau. Uh, the plan is to hit every bureau in the department at least a couple times. Uh, and then hit some of the other groups, uh, some of the religious groups and some of the other uh, stakeholders that might not be represented in one specific uh, bureau but might kind of have a reach throughout LAPD's footprint. Um, but that meeting will be scheduled and it will be myself and a couple members of my staff. And the next one after that will also be in South Bureau but will be entirely in Spanish. And that will be about four weeks after that. So we're going to uh, keep doing these and hopefully find new ways to reach out to the community and let the uh, community know what the Inspector General does and what the Commission is doing and what it finds important. And that concludes my report. I thank you very much. Um, looking forward to uh, hearing uh, the results of those meetings. I think that's an excellent plan and, and an excellent partner to have uh, joined with. Uh, information filed items is uh, item number five, the noise variance permits on file, uh, of which there are four. Uh, special event permits on file uh, after this last week, I'm sure, uh, in Los Angeles. Happy to see that there are no special event permits on file. And uh, that is only for information, and more information is in your agenda. Uh, are there any presentations today? Uh, no, Madam President. Uh, the consent agenda, uh, items 7, uh, A through D. Is there any motion? Move approval item 7A through D. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It is approved. <coughs> We're going to move on to the regular agenda items. Before we call anyone up, uh, I know we will, of course, be hearing first from uh, uh, the department uh, in 8A. Uh, uh, which other items now that uh, 8F is gone uh, do we want to hear? B, D? B, B, B. And, and, and I think D, do, uh, do we want to hear your, uh, something on the valets? Absolutely. Yes. No okay. And H. 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 And H. And I'll accept a motion. <coughs> Little approval of items 7, uh, 8, C, E, and G, I guess it is. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, approved. All right, well, let us begin then with uh, A, which is the verbal presentation and discussion uh, regarding um, gang reduction and youth development program and the partnership with the Housing Authority. We have a large contingent today and uh, very, very pleased because it is something that the Commission uh, has been following uh, with your assistance and we wanted uh, even more information so that we don't have just the sheer statistics, but we can hear better the, the stories of, of the people involved. Uh, and we just appreciate your being here. And it looks as if, uh, uh, Deputy Chief, you're going to start off. 
Madam President, I am. Good morning, members of the Commission. Uh, Kirk Albanese, Chief of Detectives. One of the hats that I wear is I'm the gang coordinator for the department. Uh, and so we have a presentation that the Commission asked for this morning. We'll be disciplined in terms of uh, our speakers because we have about six, uh, and so we uh, will be respectful of time. I'd like to um, open by introducing uh, the members that are with me uh, here this morning. Um, uh, from the uh, Mayor's Office of uh, a gang reduction and youth development, Miguel Leon. Oh, here too. He's up at the front table. Hey, everybody. Um, uh, from Hakla, uh, Housing Authority, City of Los Angeles, Joel Lopez. He's with me at the podium. Uh, from Southeast Area, uh, Sergeant Amada Tingarides. Uh, from Hollenbeck Area, uh, Sergeant Ken Edwards. Um, and in the room, because it, it needs to be said, uh, both of their, uh, well, you know, Bob Green is here. I'm not sure if. Uh, Jose is here as well. Uh, both uh, Chief Green and, and Chief Perez, uh, very much staunch supporters of what we're going to talk about this morning and um, really have uh, taken ownership, which is so important at a very high level, uh, to make this work. So I want to thank them. Uh, and also present is Lieutenant Mike Olpelt uh, from Gang and Narcotics Division, who will talk about uh, the Gang Intervention Academy. You know, I wanted to open it in terms of a broad brush just to uh, paint the picture of the manner in which we are constructed uh, to enforce uh, against gang crime uh, and then to work toward intervention prevention uh, uh, within the city. Uh, you know, first within the 21 area police stations, we have a GIT, a gang impact team that is broken down into a gang enforcement detail and a narcotic enforcement detail uh, with a detective component for investigative follow-up. So that's important. That is a, a fixture at each of the 21 police stations uh, in the city. We have currently nine CLEAR sites. Um, CLEAR uh, program is designed to provide additional resources in an area that has been identified as hanging, having gang-related crime, a gang-related problem as it relates to public safety. Uh, and so we have nine CLEAR sites in the city. Most of those are in South Bureau. In addition, we have 45 court-ordered injunctions, gang injunctions, uh, that we oversee uh, within the LAPD. Um, at Gang and Narcotics Division, they have functional oversight uh, in terms of support, coordination uh, for the whole city, and that's uh, in part Lieutenant O'Pelt's role and supported by Captain Hart, who's also in the room, Commanding Officer of Gang and Narcotics Division. I want to touch just briefly on, on some of the, you know, the, the, the vision of, of Chief Beck certainly uh, is not Enforcement. If we've gotten to enforcement, then we have, along the way, uh, missed an opportunity toward uh, prevention. Uh, and so the chief is very much committed, as is Chief Pacinger, in terms of our efforts toward intervention and prevention. And I just want to touch on some of the programs that will ring a bell, not all inclusive, but just some of the highlighted programs. Certainly you've heard of Jeopardy, one of our programs, Juvenile Impact Team, two examples of intervention-based programs. On the prevention side of the house, um, what I consider, and I believe Chief Pacinger considers the flagship of prevention is the cadet program. Um, certainly the police activity lead. Uh, more recently, LAPD Kids, which is now a website uh, that, that gives the, the media ability for young people to go on and, and receive a positive message. Um, you're going to hear about the Community Safety Partnership in a few minutes, uh, and you're going to hear about Summer Night Lights, all prevention-based so that we don't have to engage in the enforcement aspect. Um, with that, uh, you know, it needs to be said also the chief has very high expectations of all of us in terms of not only the reduction of overall crime in the city, but the reduction of gang crime, the prevention of gang crime, and steering people on the right path. Uh, and so um, part of that effort uh, involves gang intervention, uh, and Michael Pelt is going to start in terms of talking about the Gang Intervention Academy uh, and some of the aspects of gang intervention. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. Uh, the uh, Gang Intervention Academy is a uh, now a long-standing partnership uh, between ourselves and the interventionist community. Uh, it began with a series of grant-funded uh, programs through the Project Safe Neighborhood uh, program. Um, 
and the primary vendor on that has uh, that we've worked in concert with now going on more than three years we just concluded our third program uh, with Connie Rice and what the program consists of is a one-day school that is sponsored by gang and narcotics division to invite our intervention partners to the school to educate um, our gang officers, uh, primarily our GIT and CLEAR officers. We began the program uh, with the supervision and then uh, pushed that down to the officers. And uh, over time, we've trained in the neighborhood of 700 officers. And uh, I think what's important to point out is that these officers, you know, many of them leave their assignments in these GIT and CLEAR units yet they take with them that training that they received and they filter that out to other officers with, within their command and their respective patrol divisions. And the benefit to be had in all of this is that when we do have uh, an unfortunate or tragic event such as a gang murder or something along those lines, we already have that communication established between ourselves and the interventionists. It's not meeting somebody on one side of the yellow tape that night to learn where things stand. And uh, an additional aspect of that along the prevention component, not, not the programs that the chief highlighted a moment ago, but with the interventionists acting in concert with us, uh, it's the prevention of retaliation shootings. That's, that's the key there, to, to shut that, that component down uh, as soon as possible and, and not have that ping pong game begin between two, two sets or two clicks. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, we're pursuing further grant funding to continue the project, uh, particularly in light of uh, new, new individuals being assigned to those GITs and CLEARS. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Mike, thank you. And, and I think at this time we're going to ask um, uh, from the, the mayor's office, uh, representing Guillermo Cespedes, who's the deputy mayor in charge of GRID, uh, Miguel Leon, to come up. Mayor yeah. Chief. Yeah. <laughs> First and foremost, sorry for my cough. Um, definitely apologize. I know it must be a bit annoying. Guillermo Cespedes sends his regards, apologizes for not being here. Actually, at our press conference, kicking off our gun buyback effort in partnership with LAPD, which I'm sure as folks are. As is the are, chief. As, as, as chief is the chief. Today, exactly. So. There you go. So, if we're talking about great LAPD partnership, that's the epitome there, right there. Exemplifying um, the partnership that is has been created. Um, as folks might be familiar, GRID uh, takes a geographic approach uh, to its efforts, has identified 12 gang reduction youth development zones across the city of LA. And within each of these areas, we try to pretty much saturate these communities with as many uh, resources as possible. Uh, these are areas throughout the city that experience four times greater gang violence than any other parts of the city. Um, and within each of them, uh, we've established um, gang prevention and intervention programs. Gang prevention focusing on youth ages 10 to 15 years old. Intervention focusing on uh, youth and young adults 14 to 25. Um, each of the prevention and intervention components have a model of practice uh, that each of our contracted agencies are following. Um, and we've seen some tremendous success both on the prevention and intervention sides. Um, after six months of participation in the prevention component, we've seen um, about half of the participants, 55% of youth uh, participating in the effort, uh, are no longer eligible for services after six months. In other words, they've reduced levels of risk factors. And on the intervention side, as the uh, LAPD officers have been mentioning, we've established uh, just one example of the grid triangle protocol where crisis intervention workers, uh, the mayor's office of gang reduction and youth development, and LAPD officers are communicating back and forth right after uh, incidents occur within each of, or, well, pretty much throughout the city. Uh, between April 2009 and December 2012, over 2,500 incidents have been responded to. And this is one of a kind in the country where the mayor's office, LAPD, or the law enforcement entity and crisis intervention workers have that direct line of communication. The academy that was mentioned is the, the only of its kind in the country as well. Um, another one of the programs that has been mentioned um, with 
through which you know we try to keep youth on a positive path as the Summer Night Lights program. That's going to begin its sixth, its sixth year um, this coming summer. Uh, 2008 to, to, through 2012 has seen tremendous success. We're now at 32 different locations. Just to give you some quick stats, uh, meals served 2012 were 438,360. Um, violence reduction uh, for five consecutive summers, we've seen violence reduction in and around the communities where um, summer night lights parks are located. That includes a 47% reduction in gang-related homicides, 35% reduction in gang-related part one crime. And what is it that we do? We keep the park open. We pretty much uh, invite the entire community out uh, Wednesday through Saturday during the summer months to participate in free basketball, free softball, free soccer, um, arts programs through the Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, and free food every single night. I'll repeat that. Free food every single night for everybody in attendance. And, I mean, I can um, talk a little bit more about jobs created. Um, in 2012, 1,700 local jobs created, including 352 at-risk youth hired. We have a position called a youth squad position where we bring in kids from the community and we, and we tell them, help us run the program. Help us coordinate it and implement it. Uh, attendance has been through the roof since 2008. There have been 2,506,260 visits to the different summer night lights sites um, that have been established. And as I mentioned, I can you know keep talking about stats and numbers, but it's um, somebody mentioned earlier the stories that really count. Um, I've, I have the pleasure of being out on the ground. Uh, it's all hands on deck during summer night lights uh, for the grid office, and the partnership that we create with LAPD is tremendous. Um, Things like food contests in Ramona Gardens where the CSP and CLEAR officers help us judge or help us count the votes that the community has submitted for the community's best salsa, for the community's best rice, for the community's best beans. Um, things like that, I don't know how it is that we can measure that. You know, it's tremendous to be able to create that partnership between LAPD and community. CSP was uh, kind enough to help us establish a CSP kickball league during summer night lights in Ramona Gardens. Um, to see 12-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds playing with the officers they're, they're still in uniform that are out there, you know, playing kickball with the kids. That's tremendous. That is a tremendous way to, to create community and create partnerships. So, um, in grid zones, we've seen 46.3% decrease in homicides, 40.2% uh, decrease in aggravated assaults, and a tremendous 667 decrease in assault with a deadly weapon on police officers. And again, I can keep going with numbers, but the communication between grid, crisis intervention, workers prevention agencies, and law enforcement, um, that sort of comprehensive approach is, is what's led to the tremendous success and the reductions that we see within uh, the community. So um, I don't know if there's any questions. Chief, I think I overstepped my bounds in terms of time. I apologize. <laughs> Miguel, thank you. Uh, great job. Uh, I think we'll, we'll hold, if the commission is, is okay with that, we'll hold and let the presentations move forward. Um, the next one is from Sergeant Tingaridis from Southeast Area on the Community um, Safety Partnership. Am Good morning, on? commissioners. Actually, I think I want to start off and maybe Joel Lopez from Housing Authority who I've officially ordained as a police officer his badge is in the mail have him start off a little bit to talk about the community safety partnership from the Housing Authority perspective and then I'll jump in after Joel thank you thank you sergeant good morning commissioners good morning, good morning chief um you know those uh, kickball games are very very competitive i gotta say they're great um you know, i'm thrilled to be here on behalf of the housing authority of the city of los angeles um you know the csp program as we know it the community safety partnership with the los angeles police department and the mayor's great office has really transformed our communities um it's been amazing for the housing authority to witness the speed and the enthusiasm with which these communities have embraced LA LAPD. Um, you know, we're beginning to see vibrant communities that uh, are unparalleled, really, in the history of the Housing Authority. We're, uh, one of the most amazing things is the transformation of civic engagement that we're seeing now. 
um, when we started this program, you know, one of the things that I would always share with the sergeant was that we need to get the silent majority. We need to get those folks out there who are afraid to come out and be civically engaged, who are afraid to participate, who are afraid of LAPD as much as they're afraid of, you know, the, the crime elements that have kind of taken hold of their communities. Um, it's been a wonderful transformation in just 20 months. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to look back and say, wow, it's only been 20 months, but these communities have done a 180 degree turn and uh, you're starting to see what's amazing is folks actually asking for LAPD presence. We, we go to meetings and they say, where are police officers? Where is police officers such and such? Which is amazing for communities that in the past uh, wanted nothing to do with the LAPD or wanted nothing to do with police officers. So that's uh, an incredible uh, tribute really to the work that's done by the officers, by the mayor's uh, great office. And um, it's really created an example of what effective intergovernmental agencies uh, can do when they work together, when they communicate communicate and how the community will be a partner with you if you are able to serve them in that capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, as most of you know, I believe that the Community Safety Partnership evolved from a vision that Connie Rice had to implement a relationship-based policing program in public housing. It's a five-year program that we started in October of 2011, and it's been implemented in Jordan Downs, Imperial Courts, Nickerson Gardens, which are all in Southeast area, specifically Watts, and then Ramona Gardens in East Los Angeles, Hollenbeck Division. The partnership that we've created through CSP involves the Housing Authority, LAPD, the Grid Office, and the Advancement Project. Um, we've mentioned in this room that in such a short time, the amount of relationship building and violent crime reduction with this program has just been astounding. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to just give you a synopsis of what the mission of the CSP program is. And it's first and foremost, public safety. But it's conducting public safety while building relationships with residents that live in public housing who at one time had great disdain and hatred for law enforcement, specifically in Ramona Gardens and starting from the late 70s, early 80s, the Watts community. So the CSP officers are building relationships with the residents. They're conducting safe passage to ensure that the youth get back and forth to school safely. We literally have officers at the ingress and egress routes of each housing development that either walk or drive to ensure that these youth get to school safely. There aren't pocket checks, there aren't robberies, there aren't individuals out there attempting to get younger individuals to sell narcotics. And once the safe passage is complete and the youth are in school, our safe passage officers are actually on campus doing anti-bullying seminars, meeting with the principal, asking if there are any issues on campus as it relates to crime. And so they've been able to link the community with the schools. And when school is out, the officers are conducting the safe passage routes from school to the developments or to some of the youth programs that we've implemented through the CSP program. Another one of our missions is to coordinate and address quality of life issues. And we do that very well with the grid office as well as the housing authority. We have the Southeast Regional Grid, or the Watts Regional Grid. Their trailer is on site in Nickerson Gardens. The case workers, the intervention workers are on hand at any time for our CSP officers to coordinate. The intervention and prevention agencies are also on site in Ramona Gardens, and Sergeant Edwards will be able to talk a little bit about that. We also coordinate with SNL. We provide suggestions for youth to be hired at the SNL sites. Our CSP officers sit on the interview panel with grid workers to help hire some of the youth from within the developments to work during summer night lights. We also have a great relationship with Verbum Day, and we've been able to provide numerous of scholarships for children to go to Verbum Day. We've also been able to provide scholarships for children within South LA to go to a four-year college full ride if they abide by a program that we put together with parental participation. So we've, within CSP, we're covering an education component, we're covering a safe passage, violent crime component, we're covering youth programming, and we're also just now working in 
building the relationship between the African American community and the Latino community within these developments. Nickerson Gardens is 67% Latino. At one time, it was opposite. It was predominantly African American. And we're working with the Advancement Project with a grant that they just got to really begin that civic engagement and begin to bridge the gap with the African Americans and Latinos within the public housing developments. The four sites that were chosen for the CSP program were, were sites because of the crime, the diminished relationship with law enforcement, and the gang crime. The numbers I'm going to talk about are just amazing and what I'm most proud of. Joel said 20 months, but it's actually been 18 months, I believe. So the program began 18 months ago, and the first full calendar year, we saw the following decreases, specifically in violent crime in the Watt sites. 53% violent crime reduction in Jordan Downs, 72% violent crime reduction in Nickerson Gardens, and a 75% violent crime reduction in imperial courts. In the first eight months of 2011, prior to the start of the Community Safety Partnership, we had a total of six homicides, two in each of the developments. We have not had a homicide in any of the CSP sites since August 28th of 2011. Since 2005, up until 2011, we had a total of 45 homicides between those three developments. 45. Just astounding. It's been a fantastic relationship. The engagement with the CSP officers and the grid intervention workers on site at campus is amazing. There'll be a grid worker standing in front of Lock High and a CSP officer talking, coordinating, exchanging text messages, coordinating on specific youth, knowing their first name, their last name, the relationship with the housing authority, We've partnered with John Stacy, who does evictions at HACLA. Our officers are able to get information from community members, work with the housing authority to get emergency transfers for folks who need to move out of the developments, to address the quality of life issues, graffiti, trash within the developments. And one of the most important aspects about us being in these developments is the relationship that we've built with the residents. Joel mentioned that the residents ask where CSP. We've been scratching our heads lately because we're now getting calls from folks saying, where are they, where are they, is the program gone? And we've come to a point where the folks in the community, in that specific community, want to see us there. And when they're not, they want to know why. They're holding us accountable. If there's an incident within any of these public housing developments, there's a phone call. We're transparent, we're able to discuss it, we attend the community meetings. We meet with the HACLA managers on a daily basis. And I think the coordination with the community allowing us to come in and GRID helping us with the intervention prevention and the schools willing to let us on campus and work with the youth has been part of the tremendous success of the CSP program. Thank you, Amada. Ken? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Ken Edwards. I'm the team leader for Ramona Gardens, and it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. I want to talk about Ramona Gardens. As you know, uh, the LAPD was the number one enemy of the uh, community there for the long time, and that's what we were told when we walked in there. Uh, kids weren't allowed to talk to us, and the way we wanted to approach that was from the outside in, establish relationship, walk footbeats, get, let people get to know us. And we started with the seniors and the moms and the parents developing programs, getting involved in walking clubs and seniors clubs, uh, having a bunch of community events like a Christmas toy drive where we had like a Santa sleigh uh, come over and, and, and give toys out and the uh, LAPD airship uh, illuminate that as we went down. Giveaways. Um, we also worked on... Uh, with gangs and intervention to look at the kids that are involved. And we went into the schools, and we're going into Murchison Elementary, Santa Teresita, and we're finding that some of the gang um, intervention work it drills down all the way to like five-year-olds. I mean, not five-year-olds, I'm sorry. Kindergartens are great, but fifth grade. <laughs> fifth graders are already starting to the signs and symptoms and looking up to their older brother, so we're intervening there. And uh, we have a great, fantastic relationship with SEA and GRID, 
and uh, the communication is great and fantastic. And I want to say with uh, when it, in regards to the clear units, how we work well with them. They're the right hand, we're the left hand, and we talk to each other. And uh, with our partners, um, uh, with all the interventionists, say, uh, we cover the full gambit, and we get everybody involved. And we're raising the esteem of the community. Uh, some of the things that we've done is we've done the Harold Robson Foundation, where we went to Cannon Creek, and we worked with a bunch of kids there, about 27 from Ramona Gardens, along with Southeast. And the officers were not dressed in regular uh, uniforms. They participated. They got down with the kids, and they played with them. At the end of the day, we put on our uniform shirt, and they said, we thought you were dads. We didn't know you were the police. And it just changed their, their whole mindset. Graffiti incidents have gone down. The, uh, I want to say the community feels safer. We're not, the, the war is not uh, won yet, but you know, one battle at a time. And it starts with the kids. And uh, like I said, we start from the outside in. And now the police are welcome there. And like Amada said, with the grid interventionist, fantastic job. We can uh, end the recruitment cycle of the gang. And that's our number one mission in Ramona Gardens. And just to give some uh, stats, um, violent crimes year to date down 67%. Property crimes down 15%. Property one crimes down 25%. One last thing, uh, we got a football team coming, Lincoln Heights Tigers, which are traditionally not welcome in Ramona Gardens. Last, this weekend, they had a football clinic in Hazard Park, which was amazing. We had a large turnout there. The kids are excited. And um, another thing is we had a problem with illegal vending in Hackla property. What were we going to do with that? So rather than you know push them out, which was not effective, we decided to educate them and get them in a, in a farmer's market. And that farmer's market is going to be certified and has good leadership now. The community actually shops and buys fresh fruit there. So um, the community involvement is great, and I want to say thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for the GRID team. Thank you, sir. Sergeant Edwards, thank you. Um, in, in closing, members of the commission, uh, a couple of points. One, uh, I want to also recognize uh, Captain Phil Tingridis, who's in the room, um, a modest husband, um, and, and also a staunch supporter uh, of this whole issue of gang intervention and, and gang prevention. Um, and also Anita Ortega uh, from Hollenbeck area, who I talked to yesterday and, and fully behind this as well. Both of those individuals uh, need to be recognized. And in summary, you know, we, we, we talk about this, we, we talked about it earlier about taking a look at a crime snapshot for a period of time, and we chose five years. And if you go back to 08, between 08 and 12, the 11 crimes that we identify as gang crimes in the city of Los Angeles are down 36.85%. That's a contemporary period of time consistent with a lot of what you're hearing. Um, Chief Pacinger mentioned in his remarks, year to date, gang crime down 20%. Uh, and so at the end of the day, there has to be a result. That's the result. Still more work to do. We're not where we need to be, but we're, I think, heading in the right direction. Thank you very much. Commissioners? Okay, well, wow, exactly, exactly. No, this is very impressive, and, and I think it's important to have you all in one room together uh, uh, so that uh, the public and all of us can be reminded. Uh, too often, as we talked about uh, numbers, uh, they're very important, and that's how we measure ourselves. But it's the story of the change and, and, and what you actually do day in and day out. I, I guess one of my first questions is not only how res because how resource intensive it is what do we see in the future do we see an ability to expand do we see an ability to intensify in the same area uh, wh wh what do we what do we see 18 months from now maybe maybe i'll start just by saying that we had a discussion earlier about clear funding uh, we had a discussion about funding as it relates to the Intervention Academy. We have challenges ahead of us as it relates to budget, um, but as it relates to our passion for what we're doing, that, that is, is clearly there. And, and uh, there are other programs, in fact, Michael Pelt can talk to uh, one where we've been awarded, um, a preliminarily awarded a, a grant uh, which will allow us to focus on prohibited possessors within gang communities within the city uh, that we can focus on in terms of removing even more guns from the street. Yes, it was a, uh, a grant that became available to us um, in February. 
Uh, we competed with six other agencies, including the uh, L.A. District Attorney's Office and other uh, law enforcement agencies within California. Uh, we, Chief Albanese was our presenter. Um, there were four or five of us that, that did it. And um, they had never seen a program that well formatted, that well outlined in terms of its scope and its mission. And within half a day, we learned that we had secured the nomination for that, uh, that grant. Um, and it's, it's still pending congressional review. Uh, but it is a uh, target-specific program that we're, we're going to highlight the RDs, reporting districts, where crime, gang crime specifically is at its highest, and begin with those. And then as we knock those down, uh, filter the process outward. Another component of it is the prohibited possessor uh, enforcement. Um, because at the end of the day, all we want to do is remove guns from the street. Uh, too many of them are stolen. Too many of them are sold. If we can get more guns out of the community through the uh, apps, the uh, prohibited possessor enforcement, and gun buybacks and things of that nature, then all the better. We'll take that tool away. Uh, I would just like to, first of all, uh, congratulate all of you. Uh, certainly, our department, uh, as well as the mayor's office and, and HACLA, uh, to me, this is the epitome of community policing. You know, it, uh, you know it's, this is a much talked about subject, but uh, the, the manner in which you have, um, you and those officers, as well as the uh, intervention workers and others have uh, made a commitment. And just in your, your presentation, I, 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 could, I could feel it, the, the, the passion, and the, which I think is so important. As I recall, I believe when this program was first um, presented to us, um, uh, I think uh, Captain Tangaritas uh, uh, had made the comment that a number, I forget the number, but you had an overwhelming number of people, officers who volunteered to, for this assignment. And they were interviewed and, um, and they were very carefully uh, selected so that uh, these were people who wanted to, to be there, who really were committed to uh, establishing the kind of relationships that you've talked about uh, with the community so that uh, uh, LAPD is no longer seen as the enemy, but seen as um, as partners uh, <coughs> seeking to make sure that the you know that the the, the housing projects <coughs> were made safer, <coughs> and equally importantly, the community beyond the housing projects. You talked about the safe passage for for the the students attending uh, school and. Uh, the general uh, overall improvement of climate. So I, I just say that this this is just a very, very uh, significant and impressive um, um, partnership that you've established, and and it demonstrates that uh, what can work when you have all partners committed who share this, uh, the same vision and uh, seek to accomplish the same goals. So. Uh, I just hope, as uh, Commissioner Orton indicated, that uh, we will continue to have the necessary resources to not only uh, sustain uh, this program, but hopefully in future years uh, potentially be able to expand it. So just congratulations to all of you. Outstanding job. Extremely well done. And to the, to the men and women who, who are there each day on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you very much. Uh, one more comment, I think. Yeah, uh, we br have one. Briefly, Madam President, you know, three thoughts came to my mind as, as I was watching this. Uh, the first is um, every week uh, I've been very happy, and, and today Chief Pacinger delivered the good news about the, the great effects we're having on reducing gang violence and crime. And this explains it. And what I heard today wasn't necessarily what I would normally think of as police duties of 
of, of lights in parks and kickball games and setting up farmers markets and going to schools. Uh, that might not be considered law enforcement, but we see that it's a holistic and total effort that causes these reductions. And the great leadership of the mayor's office in, in setting up GRID, I think that's the first big city in the country that's done something like this. And the chief's efforts in doing this sort of in, in, inventive uh, uh, prevention, uh, that explains the numbers. It's not magic, it's not luck, it's all this hard work and all this money expended. And that's my second point. Uh, I know that there are uh, budgets and I know people look at this stuff, but when I think of the human cost of crime, when I think of the economic cost of crime, whatever we're spending on this is pennies on the dollar of what not spending this would cost this city. Uh, my final thought is, uh, I've said it at every graduation, I know the chief served me and, and Chief Basinger, is uh, this uh, department is, in my opinion, the most innovative uh, department in the country, but more importantly, it's the most copied department in the country. And I know that in other parts of the country, gang violence, such as in Chicago and other places, is is the opposite of this. It's going up and going up dramatically and very sadly and critically. And I hope that um, that over time uh, the mayor's office can promote what it's done and use that as a model and what the department has done and use that as a model for the rest of our country because, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. This isn't smoke and mirrors. This is actual improvement in people's lives, actual improvement in safety, and it's done in a very innovative manner and ways that I, I was just astounded listening to all the stuff you guys are doing. And it's sort of like, uh, I feel like I was in a magician's tent and I saw how he does the tricks now. So I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you again very much from all of us. And uh, just unfortunate that the competing press conference uh, is over there, but we'll find other ways to get the word out to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, we do have one public comment on this item. Yes. We have uh, Monica Harmon. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Alex Earl. Um, 1998, I was a DART volunteer at Hollenbeck Division, and when we had calls into Ramona Gardens, we could not respond and help the victims because the gangsters would shoot at us. And for decades, uh, Ramona Gardens that had a lot of hazard gangsters there, very few now. It was hostile, it was a bad reputation. You just stayed away from there, even if we had friends there. In fact, growing up, I was in the boundaries to go to Santa Teresita, but my parents said, no, you're not going there. And I, we had to walk three miles to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, I was happy to give an anti-bullying assembly at Grape Street Elementary. You know, when I asked the kids how many of you there are being bu bullied, over 20%. And you could see them, but the interaction with officers were, was really positive, and I hadn't seen that in the South as much as I've been seeing the last decade. Uh, it's slowly getting there. Um, one of the best gang interventionists, Johnny, <clears throat> Johnny Godinas from SEA, who years um, believed in relationship with officers before any of this grid passed away last week. And I'm fortunate we have to go to his services tonight. But um, he was one of the best. And he believed in giving gang members a second chance and then um, Sorry. Um, <clears throat> the CSP officers um, have really done a great job at Hollenbeck. With, they have three daycares in Ramona Gardens. They have two schools. They're constantly mentoring. The farmer's market is excellent because parents there don't have cars. They have to take a bus, and sometimes it takes two hours to go to the market and come back. So that's a great thing. Um, thankfully, the LA Times did... There you go, Joel, there's your shout out. A great article last week about Ramona Gardens and the transformation and the change. And um, you know, I have seen, I work in Hollenbeck for many years and I have seen a positive transformation in that area. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for all of your work in the bullying area. We really appreciate that as well. Um, and with that, uh, we will uh, take the, the, we don't need a vote on A, right? Uh, and we'll go to B, the department's verbal presentation and discussion, latent fingerprint backlog.
Good morning, Yvette Bernie, um, SID. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that we're holding our own in spite of the fact that our resources are down. Um, we have uh, actually seen a, about a 250 case drop in our backlog for the last quarter. Um, Probably uh, a good deal of that is some of the cases from 2010 and 11 that dropped out of statute. But more importantly, we're not seeing the backlog increase. Even though we're losing some, we're not seeing it increase. So that's a, a positive thing. Um, for the last quarter, um, as we mentioned last time, we have implemented a 10 case priority um, uh, per area um, uh, project for our property crimes and that is uh, going very well. We uh, looked at 607 cases this last quarter and out of that we had 168 potential suspects identified so that that's really good. Um, Chief Albanese and I were at a, a meeting that he calls quarterly with his detective COs just a, a couple of days ago and we asked them how this program is working and we got a lot of positive feedback. Apparently, um, it's giving them suspects uh, much quicker than our old way of operating. So this reduction, um, this reduction in resources has forced us to re-examine how we were doing our business and actually um, we're doing it better. So very, very good result. Um, we also instituted the ELPO program. We told you about that last time. Um, we had 32 officers involved in that, um, working for the various areas. We've seen a couple of folks move on to other assignments, so we're looking at doing another training program so we can get a few more uh, ELPO officers out there to help us collect the fingerprints. Um, and that's basically the status. If you have any questions? I don't think any questions, but uh, just a good report, and we like to keep hearing reports like that. Thank Thanks. you very much for all your work, too. You're welcome. Madam President, if I may, on this item, uh, Chief Albanese briefed me on a meeting that uh, he and Yvette had with uh, Councilmember Mitchell Englander, the Chair of Public Safety, and the Councilman indicated that it would only be necessary for a uh, report every six months from the Department on this, so I would recommend that to uh, uh, free up the department that we have the first report in July of this year, which would cover the period January through June, and then in January of next year, the report to cover for July through December, and that would be the reporting format. If the commission is agreeable to that, then that would be the way we would it certainly proceed. sounds good to me. Uh, I see no objections at all. I think that's excellent. No actions necessary. That's just information to you all. Great. Thank you. And now we'll hear uh, from the executive director related to the uh, uh, permitted valet parking issues. Good morning, Madam President. It's my pleasure uh, uh, to uh, give you a brief overview of the valet program and also the permit fees that will be established. Uh, coming forward, uh, Senior Management Analyst 1, Stacy Rafter, and Senior Management Analyst uh, 1, uh, William Jones. Uh, Stacy did the staff report for me, and William is the supervisor of our permit section. So if you have any specific questions as it relates to the fee or the processing, I would defer to either one of them. But I'll give you a, a background. Uh, this uh, project has been in place for, at this time, about three years in making. It involved the uh, involvement of the uh, Chief Legislative Analyst Office, Council Offices, uh, the uh, Commission Investigation Division, and my folks meeting, along with DOT, to discuss the fact that in the City of Los Angeles there is no permitted or regulated valet program. Uh, most people are shocked by that. What that has allowed to occur is an individual could go in front of a row of restaurants or other locations where you would typically see valet services, put up a sign, and charge to park cars. And there was no regulation or permitting. Uh, there would be uh, uh, fisticuffs erupt in some of the busy areas uh, competing for spaces. There would be individuals taking a car. Uh, let's say an individual drives up in their very expensive automobile. They hand the keys to an individual to park the car. They have no idea who they're giving their keys to. Uh, that car would get parked somewhere around the corner, possibly in, on a public street and possibly in a red zone. You'd come out to get your car. You'd give the claim check if you had one. You would uh, be given your car back, but what you didn't know is when the valet went and got your car, there was a parking citation for parking in a red zone or too close to a fire hydrant that was crumpled up and thrown on the ground. 
basically no accountability. Also lost within this was the parking occupancy tax, which a, a operator who parks cars and charges is responsible to give the city 10% of the parking fee. So those all led to the fact that there needed to be some type of regulation. A very difficult process in the city of Los Angeles because parking is limited in some of the areas uh, that you would want to have vehicles that are taken from a valet parked in an off-street location so they are not taking public parking. There are some areas where public parking will be have to have to be taken, uh, and that is a piece of this process that the Department of Transportation has. An individual who has a restaurant or other type of location that wants to have valet service and they have metered parking currently, they will apply to the Department of Transportation. There will be a fee established by DOT for you to buy that curb space from the city based on what that meter rate would be that you'd be occupying. You'd pay that to DOT. Uh, our role in the process will be twofold. One, we will permit the uh, parking valet operator, as we much now permit auto parks, uh, and they will be given a, a permit based on the fact that they complete our application process, ensure that they have the appropriate insurance, they have an identified parking plan and travel plan of where the vehicles will go, they will be given their, their permit. Their permit fee is $314. Uh, that's a fee that's been established that we also have for the auto park companies. So we see similar operation. That fee could be adjusted either up or down as we really get an application process in place. The next is for the individual valet attendant. That would be the person you give your keys to at the curb. Uh, it was my belief from the beginning we needed from a public safety perspective to ensure that the person you're giving the keys to has a driver's license, has not been convicted of auto theft or burglary because you are giving them keys to your car and in that car is your registration to your home, etc. And you might want to have faith that you're giving your keys and, and uh, valuables to someone who can be trusted. So with that, the permitting process for the individual valet, valet occurred. And that fee uh, was established at uh, $70. $70, and that individual valet will be given a valet ID card issued by Commission Investigation Division. They can move from valet company to valet company with that one, per one permit. Uh, a lot of these folks are college students, young people doing uh, part-time employment, so they'll work for multiple operators. So it isn't necessary to get a permit as they go to each operator. They would have one permit that would be good for a year, and they would be able to work for multiple operators. That in, that in an overview is the, the concept of the program. On f this past Friday at City Council, the City Council made a few technical amendments to the ordinance, instructed the City Attorney to prepare the ordinance. It should be back to them within a few weeks. Once it comes back to them, the ordinance will be implemented and there will be a 30-day uh, waiting period for the ordinance to come about. And then will come the challenge for us. Um, and Commission Investigation Division to notify the, the current valet operators of the new regulations. And we have a strategy in place to do that in a variety of ways, press releases, meeting with the parking industry, and also we're going to use Commission Investigation Division officers to go out in the evenings to give out informational items to the valet attendants to pass on to the companies to get people in compliance. We recognize that's going to take a period of time, but we, we believe we have a solid strategy where we can gain compliance over the, the next several months to the ordinance. If you have any specific questions that I've not answered, either William on the permitting side or Stacy on the development of the fee side, uh, would be happy to respond to you. No questions. I'm just somewhat surprised we don't have a bunch of valley operators on here protesting. Well, that, that, that's what I, uh, my question was, uh, has there been any uh, opposition to this uh, or do they know, do the operators know that this is coming? Oh, they very well know about it. Uh, and uh, opposition, there has been none. We've had through Public Safety Committee uh, probably a half a dozen uh, public safety sessions where we've presented along with DOT. They're well aware of it. There's been no opposition, just what the program will entail. And the things that I've discussed as to getting people into voluntary compliance, working with them and not going out the day it becomes effective and start issuing citations. I mean, that was the spirit of how we want to go about this is to get people in compliance to uh, be able to regulate the industry. They'll just pass the cost on to <laughs> those yeah. of us who use the service. <laughs> yeah, they, they most likely will, but you also need to understand all the cities around us have the same program that we're implementing. Mm -hmm. So we, we really have been the only city without any regulated valet program in Southern California, certainly, in most big cities also. I guess we're fortunate that we've had as little uh, crime that we know of uh, yeah, yeah. at the moment. but. Uh, 
thank you very much. I don't, we don't have specific questions. Certainly sounds like a, a, a good program, and, and especially if enforced, as you're saying, uh, to be sure that everybody really understands and knows what it is. Once we have the, the education piece and everyone gets in compliance, then will come the enforcement piece, which I'm sure will follow. I'll accept a motion. Move approval of uh, regular agenda item 8D. Uh, Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It is approved. Second. And it will be transmitted to the city uh, administrative officer and chief legislative analyst. And then now it's uh, H, I believe, the department's report uh, relating to the uh, command accountability performance audit in South Bureau. <coughs> Narcotics. And Oops, excuse me, I'm sorry. Deputy Chief Green. Good morning. Good, morning. good to Mayor, see you. And, uh, Chief. Good to have seen that uh, presentation earlier today, and congratulations for all you've done in that regard. We're extraordinarily proud of all the, uh, the men and women that have taken part in it. They've done a great job. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Jeff Phillips, Internal Audits Inspection Division. I'll just go ahead and uh, briefly uh, go over the Operation South Bureau Narcotics Enforcement Detail Command Accountability Performance Audit. It's a mouthful. Uh, so this is the fourth uh, NAD Kappa that was conducted uh, department-wide. South Bureau was the last one. Um, there was a total of five objectives that were assessed, but 12 different tests that were that were conducted you can see that through the the sub objectives uh, I'd like to just briefly go over uh, three objectives um, that we saw some some issues some areas of, of improvement uh, the first one objective 2d that uh, covers the comment sheets and this pertains to the comment sheets uh, during search warrants now all the comment sheets were present. However, the issues pertain to uh, consistency and accuracy and, and the completion in their entirety. So really just filling out boxes and all the requirements being documented. Uh, but all the common sheets were, were in, the, in the packages. Uh, the next, next objective, objective number three, consistency of, of information. Um, well, overall this dealt with just the, con again, consistency and accuracy uh, of information being documented throughout all the documents in the package. And really just, um, I, I, you could sum it up with just paying attention to detail and uh, really just uh, being sure they're consistent and, uh, and accurate in the information. And lastly is the standard, standard uh, base assessment. Um, this has been a challenge. You can see with the other bureaus, it's been a challenge uh, across the board. Um, with the packages that were held out, there was really only five that at the time of the audit uh, had not been completed. Uh, and then there was eight that had been completed but were completed uh, beyond the 90-day requirement. And uh, that, uh, that sums up my presentation. Of, I'll hand it over to Chief Thank Green. You. Thank you. Okay, uh, within the, uh, the assessment, a lot of good news, a lot of things are being done right. Um, my biggest concern of the things that we have done to target it is the attention to detail. As you know, we have multiple officers involved in, in completing reports, some officers completing property reports, other arrest reports. So it really comes in the supervisory oversight, not only with the, uh, the NED, the narcotics supervisor, but with a watch commander when he approves a report. So ultimately, uh, I had my uh, bureau gang coordinator and my detective coordinator meet with every single one of our uh, GIT lieutenants, our NED supervisors, and our watch commanders, and I attended that training and uh, made a presentation to individuals about the expectations. Um, we're currently in the middle of assessing NED reports throughout the Bureau again to take a sampling and see what the improvement is. And so a lot of it is going to be our focus to attention to detail. Even with the, uh, the combat sheets, it's the same thing, attention to detail, getting them to put down the right dates, right times, and things like that to make sure we're within the window that seven-day period. And then ultimately, SBAs throughout the, the Bureau, we made tremendous progress with that. I now have a uh, reporting system every Tuesday when we meet with the captains to talk about crime. It gives a status of SBAs, action items, everything within their command so that as a group, the peer pressure is there to see how you're performing. You look at sick time, we look at uh, traffic accidents, everything across the board, and SBAs is one of those items that we look at. So I get a weekly snapshot of how they're doing and whether or not they're improving. And across the board, we're making uh, 
uh, consistent improvements, and we haven't fallen back at all since we put that system in place. So um, I'll have a much better idea if the systems we put in place are working when I'm done the current assessment that we're doing. Comments? I just have a question. Um, why on the, uh, on the grid do you have so many uh, not applicables or not availables under Central Bureau? Central Bureau was the first, and it was the first NED Kappa that we had conducted. And typically, when we start with a, a new audit that had never been done before, you, and when you start looking over what uh, the the unit does, you come to realize other areas that can be assessed, and that's basically what you see there. You see those areas that were not applicable; they weren't assessed for Central Bureau, uh, but we w implemented them in the work plan and subsequently into the audit for the other bureaus. I, mean, I, this is, I think this is a good report for South Bureau. I mean, there are, there's really only one area in terms of a first report where you didn't do as well as some of the other bureaus. And when you're dealing with a first, first report, I think the idea is to identify the areas that you need improvement. And really, the proof is going to be in the second report to see if uh, you are able to address those issues. Um, I agree with you. I think it's largely a matter of paying attention to detail. But you know, if you don't pay attention to detail, then other things get out of hand. And so. I do think it's critical, but I, I, to me, this is a good report. And it fair, compares certainly very favorably with the other bureaus in terms of the first report, and you know, we got to see what happens in the second report. That's going to be the key. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll uh, continue to make progress on it, sir. We're paying attention to it. And the, the captains are all very, very aware that it's a, a high priority. And it's, I think it's very important that we have gone to uh, summarizing the audit findings for each bureau. I think it's good internally for the bureaus uh, to see what's going on in the rest of the department. It, I mean, it might not be the same as Baker to Vegas kind of race, but uh, there, there is a, a sense of uh, uh, competition here. Um, and I also think that uh, the evaluation of the arrest reports across the board uh, is excellent. I mean, that, that one, just across the board, we've got that down. And uh, uh, Magistrate uh, 2A is uh, very good, again, across the board. But it, it just helps, I would think, all of the leadership, and it certainly helps us uh, to uh, have the audits prepared in this way. And then, as uh, Commissioner Druyan said, uh, to see the second time around what happens. Um, Madam President, may I? Uh, just, just for point of, uh, of note, um, every Tuesday, as, as you know, I meet with the Bureau Chiefs and also Commander Blake. Uh, some accuse me of holding them hostage on those Tuesday meetings, but we cover a lot of ground in terms of, um, you know, deployment, leadership, expectation, that sort of thing. And one of the, one of the items, which is a recurring item on the agenda, are these audits. Um, Commander Blake does a marvelous job at taking prior audits. Um, working along with IAID and giving that information to the bureaus and sharing that information across the board uh, makes no sense to be precise in one bureau and imprecise in others. Um, and so it's the, the, the goal of the object is to um, ensure to the extent that we can is to share that information um, and, and raise that watermark throughout the Office of Operations in terms of excellence. If no other questions, I'll take a motion. Move approval of 88. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you again. Thank you. Is there public comment? Yes, Madam President, we have two. We have Nathan Jackson followed by Annie Hall. Commission. My name is Nathan Jackson. I'm a detention officer with uh, the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm, uh, I've been one for four years. I'm from the last class hired <laughs> four years ago. And um, the issues I'm addressing today deal with both a grievance, with the, which, is with, which is in your guys' hands right now, and also a, a stemming complaint. Um, first, let me start off. I want to say that basically this is not the anything to do with a disgruntled employee. Like I am, I've always been considered not only a good employee, but a great employee. Like here's some of the comments I've received over the past two years. Like his hard work, team spirit, and initiative, his conduct on this day is a perfect example of the work, habits, team spirit, and initiative that we expect from every detention officer. It is officers such as Jackson who make this job enjoyable. That was from a detective who randomly came into the jail. He said, uh, this is one example of, of his commitment to excellence. 
Mr. Mr. Jackson has shown great initiative, sound decision making, and a solid knowledge of policy, procedure, and procedure. So, um, basically, basically, um, what, what this deals with first with is I filed a, I have a grievance with you guys to have currently, and um, I also I attempted to file an associated complaint. Uh, I have documentation, emails, of everything. The I got first I sent an email to the office of the inspector general who forward it all the documents I sent them to IA and he said expect a phone call. I never received a phone call from them but I called them myself and they didn't have me in the system so I called them uh, I called them and then they uh, forwarded me to a detective who I sent all my information to the email said right here it says attached are the documents addressed during the conversation I will also send you documents through my Dropbox account just in case they are too large to receive by email. This email was dated 12-18-2012. Uh, the title of the attachment is Internal, Internal Affairs Group Complaint Detention Officer Jackson. Officer, <laughs> officer I'm sorry, but it is uh, two, uh, two minutes on the public comment. We can continue the conversation, uh, perhaps uh, Executive Director or Inspector Who do you think we should have the conversation continue? I, I, I can speak to him very briefly on the on the uh, grievance status, and uh, Mr. Bustamante could speak to him about the complaint status. But any discussion related to his grievance or the complaint would be inappropriate in a public forum. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, the complaint, sir. I, I just want to say one more thing, sir. The two minutes has to be adhered to. I thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I just want to continue with my situation. Um, immediately uh, after I was bailed out of jail, my family, neighbors, witness, friends, and myself, we filed over 50 complaints with internal affairs, and we never got an answer from them. Uh, we then had a meeting with Captain Art Miller, Sergeant McGuire, um, and Captain uh, Art um, Okay, I, I um, went to uh, Captain Art Miller because we had this meeting, and then when, once I got there, um, Captain Art Miller told me that I had a right to file a complaint against the uh, two officers, the three officers and the two criminals, but um, he wasn't going to let me do it. So I asked him why, and Captain Art Miller uh, got very angry and told me to get out of his office. My family and uh, witnesses was in the front line at the front desk filing a complaint against the situation. Sergeant uh, McKnighton stopped them. Sergeant uh, McGuire threw us out of Southwest Police Department. Uh, when I went to my arraignment, uh, Judge Murphy told me there was an extreme emergency that I got back to my house so that nothing would happen to my our belongings. Um, he told me to bring in and jump to relief the next day. When I appeared the next day with my family and witnesses, uh, he told each one of them to get out of the courtroom and told me to remain. He told me that the judge did not accept the injunctive relief. And um, I asked the bailiff if I could speak to the judge personally. And um, he threatened me with arrest and told me to get out of the courtroom. Uh, my case was sent to the city attorney, Brad Rottenberg, instead of the DA, because if it would have went to the DA, it would have been a DA reject because the case had already been dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the last public comment, Madam President. And we will now uh, recess uh, and go to closed session. The Board of Police Commissioners will now recess into closed session to discuss items numbers 10A and B in accordance with various government codes.
Closed session, item number 10A1 was discussed and the Chief's recommendations were unanimously adopted. In closed session, item number 10A2 was discussed and the Chief's recommendations were unanimously adopted. And in closed session, item number 10B was discussed and unanimously approved. Madam President, is there a motion for adjournment? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Adjourned. me is it really puts a knife in the heart of somebody that has worked so hard in a business to create something